afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. Vermonter and all the canoes on the Connecticut River. This is the Vermont State Senate's Committee on Institutions. Today is the third day of February 2021. I am Joe Benning, the chair of the Institutions Committee and your host for this afternoon's events. We also have Senators Mazza from Grand Isle County, Senator Ingalls from Essex Orleans, Senator Parent from Franklin County, and Senator McCormick from Windsor County. Topic of discussion today is the Woodside Replacement, also now known as Covered Bridge, as I understand it. We have a lot of folks who are on tap for potential conversation this afternoon, and I'm going to try to do my best for the benefit of uh, our new committee members, as well as anybody who may be not a policy committee. There are several stakeholders who are on tap here that would be normally more oriented to a policy discussion. Um, I'm going to remind everybody that we're here to talk about the actual brick and mortar. So if you were coming to try to give us some conversation about the policy discussion, uh, I may need to steer you back in the direction of understanding that we're technically not that committee in the Senate. That would be the Senate Judiciary Committee who's having that conversation, as well as to some extent, the Committee on Health and Welfare. In order to try to organize this in some fashion, I'm going to begin with the Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families. Uh, Sean Brown is here with us. I also understand that Judy Rex, the Policy and Planning uh, Director for that uh, Division of Government is also with us. And I'm going to start with them, branch off into Morning Fox, who I understand is here for mental health, and then we're going to talk to uh, some folks from BGS before we get deeper into the weeds. But immediately after that, we would like to hear from Jeff Karen and Jay Walter from the Beckett School, which is um, actually going to be presenting a more specific construct for brick and mortar purposes. And then we'll see where we can go from there with the time that we have this afternoon and possibly get into as many stakeholders as we can. So with that, uh, Commissioner Brown, I'm going to uh, first suggest that you introduce yourself for the purpose of the new committee members who are here, as well as the public on YouTube. And with respect to each witness following thereafter, a brief introduction of who you are and how you fit into state government would be very helpful. With that, Commissioner Brown, are you ready to proceed? I am, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Sean Brown, a commissioner for the Vermont Department for Children and Families. Um, up until October, uh, we had uh, operated uh, the Woodside Juvenile uh, Rehabilitation Center, um, which was closed uh, legislatively in the restatement budget at the end of September, effective in into October. Um, we did close that facility. Um, as a part of, of that work, we were asked to submit a plan um, to the legislature um, to, for consideration in terms of a, of a replacement service for justice-involved youth that needs a higher level of uh, treatment and care. Um, we submitted a proposal um, to, to the legislature to move forward with a treatment center in Newberry, Vermont to be uh, in a property that's currently owned um, by Beckett, and you have uh, Jeff and, and Jay from their organization today here with us as well. Um, and there's a couple components to that. One is there's actual uh, treatment component of the services we'll provide to the youth in that facility, but also um, as a part of that it was about how we would um, uh, lease the facility and the upgrades that would need to occur to that facility to provide that secure level of treatment. Um, and just for background for the committee, um, in our restatement budget, we had set aside $1.2 million um, towards the cost of renovating uh, the Newberry facility, which is a former inn, um, to bring it up into the standards to provide that level of uh, uh, treatment and care for justice-involved youth. Um, it's, it's contemplated to be a six-bed facility. Um, and so we presented that plan to uh, the Joint Justice Oversight and the Child Protection Committees. Um, they voted unanimously uh, to approve it with some conditions um, and then make the recommendation to the Joint Fiscal Committee, which at the end of November, around November 20th, voted to approve the plan. 
And so we've been moving forward since then um, with our partners, which in, uh, include mental health, um, uh, Beckett, um, buildings and general services, and also Beckett have uh, been working and connecting with the community of Newberry as well um, to move forward with the design, to finalize the design for that plan and also begin negotiating um, the lease agreement for that facility um, and how that would interact with the investment we're making in that property. I believe we uh, are just finalized, uh, come to an agreement on the finalizing of a design for that plan. Um, and so we, we shared those with the committee um, today by email, the kind of the floor plans of what that will look like for the committee. Um, and that's the brick and mortar piece. We've not provided any information regarding the treatment services, as you indicated at the beginning, we're focusing on the bricks and mortar. Um, and I'm sure today, I think BGS is with us as well here today, and they can speak to the work they're doing negotiating the lease with Beckett and how we're moving forward to protect the state's investment that we're gonna make in that building to, to make it um, available as a use for, to, to provide that level of treatment. You know, because in our budget adjustment, that's currently, I believe, passed the House or soon to pass and is now in the Senate, there's an additional $2 million in our budget adjustment one-time funding for the remainder of what we project to be the renovation cost for that facility. We're projecting to be around 3.2 to 3.4 right now based on um, the work we're doing with, an, with the architect um, to make the design of that facility. And so we're really approaching this um, to make sure the state's investment is protected in the lease through a long-term lease arrangement, um, like, like a 10-year lease with possibly renewable for another 10-year year lease of Back at concert, I mean, uh, BGS can certainly speak to that in a little bit more detail, but also a part of that, uh, there might be a, a buyout clause where we could purchase the facility in the future if the state cho chose to do so. Um, and the reason we're looking at this in, in two agreements, like an operating agreement and a lease agreement, is we recognize there may come a time where Beckett doesn't want to operate the facility or we may want to move in a new direction and we want to be able to maintain access use of that facility long term even if it's a new provider providing the care to the youth in that facility. I would also say as one of the conditions um, th um, that it was passed through joint fiscal committee based on the recommendation of those joint committees um, was that there be community engagement and right now um, we're working to um, uh, have a, a community forum um, with the community of Newberry on February 11th at 6 a.m. and Jay Walter from Beckett to speak more to that format, but uh, we will, uh, DCF leadership, myself will be there as well as Beckett to kind of outline, uh, you know, the program that we're gonna be providing to youth, uh, the, the, the design of the building and the renovations that will occur, um, the investments that we're making in that community and hopefully we'll be um, hiring um, staff from the neighboring um, in their town and neighboring towns to, to run the facility at all different levels of positions. And so that's the work uh, and information we'll share with the community and also get their feedback. And so that if uh, there's things we need to incorporate into um, the design or how it's gonna be operated, we wanna be sensitive to the community's concerns as well. Um, Sean, can I just stop you? Did, can you tell me the date of that again, please? Uh, February 11th, I believe, and, and Jake, um, Walter from Beckett can confirm that, but my understanding is that February 11th at six o'clock. Yeah, not 6 a.m., 6 p.m. I was gonna say, I thought I heard 6 a.m. Yeah, I get up early because I don't sleep, but uh, uh, we, we also, we, we, we've also scheduled a, a second um, meeting on March 4th for the community. We, we don't anticipate having a single forum. We figure the first meeting may, you know, trigger some additional questions. So we've set a follow-up for March 4th with Alma from the town. Um, and then there will also be further opportunities for the community to participate through the DRB process, which will focus more on the site plan aspects of this. Um, Jay, is that going to be a Zoom meeting? It's, it's um, Al Alma and our IT person are working out the details. Apparently they've had some struggles with the Zoom and, our cons and so they're, they're looking at a slightly different format that um, I'm supposed to get an update on tomorrow as to how they do their local meetings, but it's a Zoom-like meeting. Um, 
and 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 I'll. Um, but it might be like a WebEx or something like that. I okay, think. I just want to make sure that the area legislators get an invitation to that meeting should they choose to go. So if Alma is running the uh, the operation, I would ask you to slip her a note and say that Senator Kitchell and I and Joe Parsons probably ought to be invited to that. Okay. Sean, I'm coming back to you. I cut you off. Sorry about that. No, no, that, uh, that that's fine. Um, I think it was appropriate to let Jay jump in there. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we are moving forward, uh, you know, with our work with Beckett. I think we're making good progress where we, we are at the point where we hoped we would be at this point in time. Um, you know, our goal is to have the facility up and running um, by the end of, of this year, at the end of December. But obviously there's a lot of, of planning still to do we, um, once we get the final approvals from the town to move forward with this. Um, you know, we'll need to go out to bid for a contractor and then do the work. And then, um, and so there's a lot to happen in the meantime, you know, and we certainly want to be sensitive to, you know, in the engagement with the community that we're receiving their feedback and, it, and we're um, appropriate incorporating that into, um, you know, the work we're doing on the building, if there's concerns um, that the town has or in the, or in the programming that we're we run the facility, we certainly want to be responsive to the community and make sure we're meeting everyone's needs. Um, Sean, you brought Judith Rex with you today. I'm not sure whether she wants to add anything to the conversation or we're... Yeah, I think be, Judy's been very involved in the planning and the work with the architects and, our, and the consultants we brought in from um, uh, the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators who've been working with us and have expertise building these type of facilities around the country. Um, and then also working with BGS. And so she could give us a high level of the work that's been going on and the feedback we've been um, soliciting on, on, the, on the renovations of the building, particularly for this committee. And, you know, in the, in the feedback, feedback we've been soliciting from like Disability Rights Vermont, we've been sharing the plan with them to make sure that any feedback they have and concerns based on their expertise of working with youth that were in Woodside, we wanted to make sure we were incorporating their concerns as well into the design. But Judy, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in and provide some additional. Um, yeah, I'll talk about Judith, Judith, before you do, I saw a hand from Senator Mazza. He'd like to interject the question. Yeah, uh, two things. One, why was the location chosen and who owns the building? If we're putting $3 million, is it our building or is it the contractor that's going to provide the services? So the uh, Senator, uh, good questions. Um, first, the building is owned by Beckett. And so we are um, gonna be entering into a long-term lease with them to secure our investment that we're making um, into this facility um, through, through the lease arrangement. And BGS could speak to a little bit more detail of how they're approaching that in, in the lease. Uh, you know, Normally when the state leases a private facility for its use, um, the cost of the renovations are rolled into the terms of the lease and, and the payment increases due to the, the borrowing cost and, and the profit that's built into that work. Uh, here, the state's choosing to make that investment on the front end to make sure it's meeting the needs of, of the youth and the program, um, but also to make sure it happens as quickly as we can, uh, but also to secure our long-term interest in that building. If we want to bring in another provider to run it in the future, we'll still have access through that investment and lease long-term to that building and with the possibility of purchasing it. Um, so in terms a lot of, of money for, for just six, six uh, people, six youth, right? You said six? Maxed out? Yes, so yes, it's going to be a six-bed facility. Um, when we had gone out and worked with BGS uh, on a Woodside replacement um, over the last couple of years. The replacement was going to be quite expensive as well for a, a, a similarly sized facility. Um, I think we had looked also worked with BGS about finding another um, uh, location in the state and a facility that could be renovated and BGS wasn't able to secure that. Um, Beckett purchased this property um, in the past and had run similar type programs there already. Um, the, most recently, it was an assessment center uh, serving uh, young boys. Um, and they wound that down in September and started working with us to, to convert it to use here. So this property has been used for a similar purpose since Beckett purchased it. 
and I'd let Jay yeah, just share the date with the, the committee. The yeah. Price tag. Yes. Um, before we go any farther, and I don't know whether Sean or Judith, you want to talk about this. I do understand you sent us a report earlier, uh, but unfortunately, all of us on the committee have been out flat in other Zoom meetings. I would be shocked if any of the committee members uh, actually had the time to read the report. So if you could give us a high level overview of what the plans are from the state's perspective for the brick and mortar, that would be most appreciated. Judy, do you wanna jump in here given your involvement? Uh, sure, sure. sure. So for the record, I'm uh, Judy Rex. I'm the director of policy and planning for DCF. Um, so I've been involved in this project from the get-go. Um, the design plans for the building have involved a quite a diverse group of people. We've had uh, three members from BGS. We've had uh, Jay and Jeff and Loray uh, Coburn, who's their treatment clinician. Um, we've had FS Family Services Division staff involved. We've had licensing staff involved. We've had legal AAGs and our legal counsel involved in the process. And so it's been, um, it's been a big group of people who have, has a lot of collective experience of running a secure facility. And I feel like um, we've done a good job addressing um, the myriad of issues you have to address when you're trying to build a secure facility for juveniles, especially for boys. I, I don't know if some of you remember, but Woodside had, um, a lot of um, acting out behavior and a lot of damage done to the facility. And so we want to avoid that by both the design plan and also on um, the building materials. And I think we're very close to a design plan. I think I'm going to let Jay or Jeff really present it because um, it's their building. But I feel that we're really on track to build a state of the art, six bed secure facility that will have really good programming for the, some of the most difficult kids in Vermont. Okay, I see that um, Denise is now screen sharing. Are you going to be referring to this report? So uh, I, in my earlier presentation, I kind of walked through what's in this PowerPoint. I think what might be helpful um, is if we pull up the architectural drawings, I think that would be of interest to the committee. And then we could have uh, BGS and uh, Jay and Jeff um, from Beckett kind of walk us through given it's their facility and they understand the way it's laid out now and kind of the changes we're proposing here and how it's really going to meet the, the needs of the building but also the program that they're going to be running for us. Okay um, who's got those drawings? I believe we sent them to, um, to your co your committee uh, along with the PowerPoint so there so, was two, two documents there that we pulled up. All right Denise do you have those available? We'll be finding out momentarily. Um, while we're waiting, I, I'm sort of trying to figure out who would be better going first. I've got a lot of witnesses from BGS here. Jay, I've also got um, you on the line with Jeff Karen, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out what makes the most sense to present this case at the moment. Um, I'm still waiting to see if Denise has the drawings. Well, while we wait for the drawings to come in, um, Morning Fox, I had asked you to step into this picture for a little bit and explain how things uh, went from where we were to where we wanna go with this conversation, at least from mental health perspective. Maybe you can weigh in while we're waiting to see if we can get the drawings put up. Sure. Uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. I can pause now that you have the screens up if you want. Yeah, I see they're <laughs> up and um, maybe we'll, we'll go with the drawing as it's now presented up on the screen. No worries. Denise, is there a possibility to hit the uh, plus button on this a couple times to see if we can get that brought up to something I don't have to read without my binoculars. I don't know if that will come up anymore. It doesn't look like it.
Okay. You may have to scroll back and forth, Denise, as we're looking, but um, turning back to you, Sean, I don't know whether you want to take the lead on this conversation or have um, the Beckett folks do that. Well, I think it would be helpful if either Jay or Jeff gave a little bit of a background on the property when they acquired it, um, their uses of it to date and um, and kind of the projected, you know, the use that we're anticipating now and, and then kind of how we're um, the renovations and then walk us through the renovations of the building and how it's going to meet our, our needs. Okay, Jay, Jay, as you uh, enter into that conversation, I'd like to have you begin by identifying who you are, what sort of services Beckett has provided in the past, and then uh, connect us to this diagram we're now looking for and how that works going forward. Okay. Um, my name is Jay Walter. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer of the Beckett Family of Services. Um, I came to Beckett in 1993 as a uh, reformed lawyer. Um, I've been a healthcare lawyer in Connecticut on a small nonprofit board up in Pike, New Hampshire, which is in the Haverhill, Bradford, Vermont region, and took over what was then known as the Pike School and later became known as the Beckett School, which was a small um, residential treatment program um, at the time that served only New Hampshire children. Uh, one of my first hires was a young man by the name of Jeff Karen who's been with me the last 27 years. Um, you know, Beckett has evolved from that small program to a uh, ra rather large alliance of four, four um, different companies in multiple states, um, including Vermont Permanency Initiative, which is technically the owner of this building. And I know it's confusing, but... Um, um, we, we've tried to keep um, our businesses aligned somewhat by state lines. Um, Vermont Permanency is a nonprofit corporation that we established in 2013, I believe, when the former Bennington School um, ran into some difficulties. Um, and DCF approached us at the time, Marion Paris, some of you may recall Marion. I'm looking for someone to rescue that program and keep it from shutting down because it served a pretty critical need for the adolescent females in particular in the state. Um, Jeff led that effort and over the last seven years, we're, we're quite proud of the effort we've put in down in Bennington to take what had become a fairly dilapidated um, um, program in need of a lot of investment under a very difficult rate system to um, transform that campus, renovate the facilities, and create what we think is a really strong program. Um, one of the things that happened involving the Vermont Permanency Program was it had a few boys down there at the time, um, and we didn't think um, that was really good considering the traumatized female population and some of the issues we were dealing with in terms of the intermixing um, so we made a decision to get the boys off site and purchased this particular facility in 2014 in Newberry um, so that we could move those young men off that campus. Um, and that program over the years evolved into sort of an assessment program focusing on a shorter term length of stay um, um, at this site. We did, it was a beautiful former inn. It was sprinklered. It was spacious. It was ideal for a small population of young men at the time. Um, um, but we did not make significant renovations. It was because it's, it was a non-secure facility. It's what they call a staff secure program, which means we had good staffing patterns. They kept an eye on the kids. If the kids alone we followed them as best as possible, but you couldn't really prevent elopement without um, um, inappropriate physical contact at times. So um, it, it was what they call a staff secure, which has limitations. 
Um, that program, um, for reasons maybe we don't want to get into, you know, we, we made a decision that we would be shutting it down um, last summer and began to look at repurposing the program. Um, while we were doing that, uh, you know, Sean became involved and we somehow, and I can't tell you exactly how the dialogue began with maybe this would be a good site for a secure program. Um, we said, well, um, we're going to probably sell it if not. So yeah, we're open to that. Um, which led to further discussion as whether, you know, Beckett would be interested in managing or somehow uh, helping to collaborate to get that program off the ground. Um, so what really began as sort of a lot of unknowns has evolved to this point now. Um, I think our, our engagement, our involvement has been, um, um, you know, w watching this concept grow into something more visually um, apparent now, but there's obviously a lot of issues involving both community and, and, and other issues to, to, to work through over the course of the next several months. But one thing we have accomplished is, we, you know, working with, you know, Judy and Jennifer Micah at DCF taking a big lead, working with us to bring other stakeholders to the table to come up with a plan for this program, which is driven by the concept of having the facility um, serve six kids and having it um, be secure, which obviously triggers a lot, triggers a lot of um, um, changes. Um, so just oh. if I could jump in, Jay, um, first, let me say, I've never heard of a reformed lawyer. That was an interesting comment. Yeah. Um, being a lawyer, <laughs> I wasn't sure that was even possible. Well, it probably isn't. But, but um, you use the terminology. I'm just trying to be mindful of people who have never been experienced to this conversation before. You use the term a staff secure facility. Um, the difference between a staff secure facility and a secure facility is, is re really the the um, the egress from the building um, in a staff secure facility. Um, you know, you you really, unless there's imminent health and safety risks um, of harm, you really can't prevent a child from exiting or leaving the facility or the area. Um, and you know, you would only do that if you really felt the child um, might exit through a window with their head first, um, um, which would obviously be a concern. Um, in, in, a, in a secure facility, you know, the doors are locked and controlled. Um, and so the student is maintained in the building um, and it's still staff secure, it's still staff intensive, but um, they can't sort of escape and elope the building. So we had Woodside in place, which is now closed. And you entered into conversations with the state about turning this locality into a secure <laughs> facility that basically replaced Woodside. Is that the easy way of saying it? I, I, I think that's accurate. Um, and, and Sean or Judy may want to add something if they feel I'm confusing people, but that's, I think that's accurate, yes. Okay. Please continue. Okay, so again, the, the facility basically is a three-story facility, three-story facility. You know, one issue is when you undertake significant renovations to a building, it triggers updated code reviews, et cetera, et cetera. And, and certainly there's some driving force in terms of oh, that, that. Oh. Let me ask Senator McCormick to mute himself. <laughs> I apologize. I thought I was muted. I'm sorry. I'm worried about him. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, did, when did you have a COVID test last? Yeah. Ask that question. So, hey, so, David, I'm so the, the mask on. Right. So okay. there's three stories to the building. Um, the the bottom floor is. Um, in, in, in the front side of this picture towards where it says covered bridge treatment center, I guess the bottom of it, um, which is the front of the building 
on the bottom floor, which is what, sh this is the second floor shown here. This is all at grade um, and all above ground. If you go to the first floor, which probably is, um, yes, perfect. Um, the, the front wall where towards where it says covered bridge treatment center at the bottom of the page is underground and the other the side at the top of the page is um, walk out. Um, so, so, so there's a grade that goes from the front of the building to the back of the building. So at the back of the building, it's above ground in the front of the building. It's um, at the, there's no windows in the front of the building. So that, that lack of light on the front of the building um, certainly drove some of this design. Um, so there's Denise, no- Can you increase that screen for us some? There we go. So the, you know, the bathrooms and the staircase um, and those areas are are not lit by by do not have natural light. So um, we certainly took steps to move the bedrooms um, towards the area where there's light, as well as the the rooms that would be used significantly during the daytime hours, which were the academic room and the multi-purpose room, which all have natural light. Um, we wanted a, if, if you look to the middle of that photo, there's an operational office. Um, you'll see that it's not dark because there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, um, glass, that can't be broken type glass to allow for staff to be in that office and support, you know, other staff working on the site um, and be able to have good lines of sight or as best as possible lines of sight throughout the building area where the ch children reside. Um, that's the purpose of sort of that centralized operational office so that it's kind of right in the middle of most of the bedrooms so that we don't have staff kind of out of visual contact um, as much as possible. Now um, in, this, in this diagram, are the exterior walls, the windows on each of the bedrooms, are they barred or are they built with some kind of a, a strong they're, they're built with a very expensive glass. Um, for instance, if, if you were to go down to the facility in New Hampshire, uh, the Sununu Center, there's glass windows there, but they're indestructible, meaning you could take a sledgehammer to them and they will not break. Um, um, so I guess the best way to describe it is indestructible glass. Um, it would take a active, it take a very, very, very um, uh, resourceful child to, to break through that glass. Um, now the, um, so that, you know, hence the security of the building. Um, there's, there was a lot of back and forth and, and I, you know, we, we, Jeff, Karen and I are, you know, are very sensitive to the concept of isolation um, and the need for program staff not to isolate children. Um, on the other side of the coin, we're also very sensitive to the question of we have you know, a likelihood of having several highly traumatized children in this facility of different age groups. And we feel there's a need to be able to have some separation of living uh, environments just because six highly traumatized adolescents in a row may not be a good match and may not be a healthy match. And indeed, there are situations where you, you know, for better or for worse, the safety of the community um, becomes more important than the um, immediate needs of, of a particular child um, to have access to all the other children. So we, we tried to come up with a creative way to, without creating a huge sense of isolation, um, also create an ability to, to do a little divide and conquering. If we had two younger kids to be able 
you know, who were very three or four years apart from other kids to be able to have them have an area that was a little bit separated, um, you know, and, and those discussions, you know, there's pros and cons and there's people on both sides of, you know, where the line should be drawn. Um, and we settled on this plan to, to try to find a balance between all those issues um, of how do you properly segment a population of people who are coming from all over the state with various issues um, and needs. And um, it led to trying to create multiple spaces where you know, staff can work with children, children can voluntarily go when they're struggling in the group setting, um, have some uh, ability to divide and conquer the population when it was appropriate. And, and frankly, sometimes when the population wants to be divided and conquered, um, but yet they're all in a house that they can't leave. So how do you create a design that allows for that kind of flow? Um, so, you know, what this gives you, you know, if you have six kids and a lot of them are having a rough day, you could be working with one child in, in a sitting area and, you know, not have them in their room, but yet have them in a sitting area, you know, tutoring them one-to-one, -one, whereas you might have another kid in, in another environment um, being tutored one-on-one -on -one because neither of those children were feeling up to that day dealing with the group, so to speak whereas the rest of the group might be on task or feeling okay and be working in the multi-purpose and academic rooms or upstairs in the gym, et cetera. So um, a, a big driving force of this design was to create multiple spaces, um, but not isolated spaces. Um, and, you know, this is the result, um, this, this floor. If you go upstairs to the second slide number two, so this is the primary living and educational environment downstairs. Um, I, I, the, the upstairs area is more the, uh, what I would call the, you know, the supportive functions um, that go into that living environment. Um, out at the top, what I guess at the, what I'm calling the bottom of the page, which is closer to the language covered bridges treatment center is an intake area, um, which is designed to have a nurse's station, um, a place for, you know, a child to be brought in by the sheriffs typically um, and have access to a bathroom. Um, you know, the theory that they might even want to take a shower and clean up before they head downstairs. Um, so we created that shower room, the shower area, you know, because, because you know, if a kid comes in the middle of the night, you don't know really what's going on all night and they may need a change of clothing and all those different things. So trying to create a a private area for the kid to start before we, and, and to get settled and acclimated um, and get a medical review, et cetera, before they head into the uh, milieu. Um, they enter, a, there's a large foyer or a fairly large foyer that we kept because it's a high traffic area. We didn't want to have the corridor too tight um, because people could be moving in different directions in that corridor. So the, the foyer is an area of transition um, which allows access to the dining room, um, a, what we call a family room, which really is a multi-purpose room um, because it's, it's not going to be just used for, say, a, a family meeting. That'll probably have a lot of um, IT supportive things for things like Zoom calls. It might be a um, a conference area for a uh, treatment team conference or, a, a, or a, a judge date, a court date with a, a child that may be done by Zoom, which was discussed at a recent hearing. Um, I think you were part of that, Senator Benning. Um, um, and do then a- video, Do you have video conferencing capability with the court system? You know, we will, by the, I mean, I guess right now we would have Zoom and that kind of conferencing, but um, I think that the, you know, as we plan through this, I think that that is wise because I do agree with a lot of the um, points that were made at that prior hearing that it's, it's an awful lot to put a kid in handcuffs and take them down to a hearing in southern part of the state and bring them back and um, for what might be a five minute discussion that, um, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of efforts being made um, on the flip side, 
we don't want to discount that that can happen too, because it also gives a child time away from the facility that might be good. So trying to create a flexible, modern environment for meetings and um, efficiencies is certainly something that will be incorporated in this, what I call the IT plan, when, when we get to that level of detail and the IT folks put this together. But, you know, I, 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 I'm not trying to be evasive, but I don't really understand or know the requirements of the judicial system for uh, video conferencing, but I'm sure the IT folks can work and figure that out. Um, um, there's a fairly large gym space there. Um, again, there's been some discussion about making that bigger. Um, the only, you know, we don't have that solution within this physical plant unless we expand the, the secure area further, which is going to add cost. Um, but with six children, and the reality is I don't think all six children are going to be there at the same time in terms of our programming. You know, we, we typically would program in smaller groups um, um, that are, you know, kids of the same age or kids who um, might be better suited to be in a, a group of three than so, you know, we probably would divide and conquer again, you know, not isolating, but, you know, using common sense of six boys together at times can be a challenge, particularly if two or three of them don't like one another. Um, that gym area exits out into a, uh, a gated area that is changing in size by the day, but is generally speaking of the magnitude of 60 by 120 feet. Um, I don't think that you provided the site plan, Sean, but there's that's being finalized. It took some time because of some wetland type issues and trying to keep and some topography issues, but it's, it's pretty far along after discussion yesterday and, and it will certainly be available by the public meeting. Um, next week. Um, but outside that gym area is, you know, you can exit from the gym into the open space. Um, the latest incarnation of that site plan, the, the earlier site plans just showed like a basketball court 60 by 120, but we're trying to integrate into that space a, a non-basketball court area that is more of a, what I would call a casual um sitting patio type area so that there probably would be a transition through that to the court area so that, you know, a child who wants to sit down outside in a nice day and read and not be running around a court would have the ability to do that. Um, and I think that the, it looks like we have a plan to accomplish that. Um, the, to the right side of the floor two is non-secure space, the security stops through the, um, um, it, the right side's not secure. And that would be an area for um, um, you know, secondary support and usage, including an IT room area, stuff that you don't want downstairs, um, as well as maybe the program director's office, and some, we, we wanna have good washing machines and stuff because there are an awful lot of uh, cleaning issues associated with working with young men of this ilk. And um, we wanna make sure that we have um, good laundry facilities, et cetera, and good storage facilities for sheets and what, whatnot. Um, certainly we envision and anticipate that some of the students um, may evolve to where they have time spent outside the secure area. But the reality is, I think the vision is if they're really at that point, we hopefully be transitioning them on. So, um, um, but, but I could see down the line, you know, some students doing really well and who, who, um, being able to, to, to go into this area and um, hang out in the, the large uh, room out there. Um, that, that's some programming stuff that, you know, I'm not the expert anymore in that. And I defer to Ray Baker and, um, you know, DCF clinical folks and, and other stakeholders as to what those parameters are ultimately going to be. But 
um, there, there is some capacity for that. Um, the, uh, so that's probably, the, that, that's really the meat of the facility itself and what the facility would look like um, from a floor plan perspective. Um, and I guess I could probably talk for hours, but I'll open it up to any questions or further comments from Judy and Sean. Yeah, I would just, um, you mentioned uh, the outdoor space and we are um, continuing to evolve that and we want to make sure we make it as large as possible to make sure that we have enough ample space uh, for the for the boys to go outside and recreate outside. Um, you know, that's an important part of the program as well. And I think the other uh, piece I would point out on the on the first slide um, where the bedrooms are and you know we discussed the windows and that there'll be really high impact windows but we thought it was important to maintain one just for the natural light but also um, the way this building is 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 sited um, that building from those out that window looks east and it looks out over an open field that slopes down but then you can see across the valley to the white mountains and so it really is a an incredible uh uh, location where this facility is, um, and Jay, I, I can't remember how many acres it is, but it, it it's off on its own private road at the end of a private road. And how many acres is the site, Jay? Um, I think it's two hundred seventy, but it's you know it's in the hundred plus. It's, it's in the high upper hundreds, but I think it's actually in the high upper two hundreds. But I, yeah. Yeah. so there's a lot of trails and a lot of. Uh, you know, there's a beautiful pond in the, in the way in the road that holds trout and, and uh, um, there's space for, you know, and, and so, I mean, w w one of the questions that's still, I think, from a programmatic standpoint that will be, you know, will be worked out, you know, is the parameters for allowing residents access to that. Um, and, you know, my hope is that that would be allowed, you know, it, it you know, th these kind of sites reflect a lot of our, you know, our, our, our philosophies about how to work with young men, you know, and, and, and engage them, you know, not just mentally, but physically in their surroundings as best as possible. But um, how far is it from Route 5? Uh, Route 5 is probably about 10 minutes. It's right off. I mean, it's very close to P&H truck stop, for those of you who know. Uh, P and H on uh, off 91, um, so it's 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 pretty much off the 91 exit, and then you kind of cross from the old. It's it's a child care facility now, but it used to be a restaurant. Um, I forget the name of it now, but Joe, you probably. I mean, uh, Senator yeah. Benning, you, probably, um, um, you, you take you take it right w. there, and it's about two minutes up the road there. Okay, so you're not really anywhere near the village of Wells River. No. Or the village of Newbury, for that matter. No. Um, okay. No. no. Um, we're, we're about two miles up behind Route 91 um, into the mountains there. Okay. Senator Mazza, I think, has. Uh, just yep. the, uh, okay, if we're investing $3 million or whatever it is, uh, there's six, the capacity is six, right? In, in, the, in this particular um, um, design, the, there is a third floor, which I, you know, I haven't mentioned because I didn't want to get sidetracked on space. That's right. not. Um, but, but so the so the the cost of operation for this outside firm, whether there's two people in there or six people, does that vary, or it it's, it maxes at six, or how does that work? So it will be a fixed cost uh, contract to operate the facility, similar. Um, to how uh, Woodside was operated, Senator Mazza. Uh, Woodside um, was approximately, uh, my memory is it was close to six million a year to operate the Woodside facility. And, um, and here we're anticipating the annual operating expense will be in the, the three million, like around the three million dollar range. But that's after we put up the 3.2 million first? Uh, correct, correct. And, and the same would it be um, with moving to a new state run facility. I think the estimates were it would be a $15 million investment, um, not counting land acquisition cost, but I would defer to BGS, but I have, I have that design on my desk here. Um, and, and 
why that location is it is it handy for services for uh, for these uh, uh, Stuart kids or I mean it seems like it's way out away from all kinds of services why not why was this building cho chosen why was this site chosen well it, it has operated in many ways as a similar type facility in the past um, size wise it met the needs um, and then working with Beckett um, they have a locus in in this area uh, 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 between New Hampshire and Vermont they run several uh, programs across the river in New Hampshire, and this would leverage their expertise and ability to run this facility. Um, I think your concerns um, are, are, you know, in terms of its location, Senator Mazza, are well understood, and I think that's why we want to make sure we have state-of-the-art technology there so that youth um, can also uh, be able to interact in court hearings or with their attorneys or with family members um, electronically. Um, also, the other thing we've been talking about um, with Beckett, and I think this will be further down the road, um, is, is what you don't see in these schematics is on the other side of the parking lot it, on this site is a separate three-car garage with, a, with an apartment in it. And so the uh, initial conversations are that if family want to come and visit the youth and stay overnight, that we might be able to, because we're leasing the whole property, that families if they want to visit the youth could stay overnight in the apartment and, and, and have visits over a series of days, you know, with the youth, if that's how they chose. I think, you know, we recognize that it is a little further out than the current facility. Um, and so we are taking those concerns as we develop the program and the technology and how families might be able to interact with the youth here, given those concerns. And it does it, it certainly must have uh, municipal sewer and water. No, it, uh, I would defer to Jay, but it has its own permitted uh, 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 yeah. water and wastewater. Wow. That, that's... When, we, when we purchased the facility, we upgraded, we put sort of kind of a state-of-the-art chopping system that um, on the septic side um, for, for capacity much larger than this um, of population. So the sewer system's new and it's frankly over capacity for this population size. Um, the water is a deep, you know, it's one of those gusher wells we call it um, that gets tested. And so we have, we really have had very little issues in terms of um, water and sewer capacity. Now it, it does limit its future growth potential, um, you know, much beyond 12 residents um, uh, Then it would, you know, so it's, it's not like this can be developed into what I would call a, a Woodside type facility over time, nor do I think that's what people want. Um, uh, you know, so you know, you know, and, and I, you know, from from our perspective, uh, Senator Mazza, I mean, it's um, we think it's a good location, but we also realize it's not the perfect location, and those are kind of public policy cost benefit decisions that um, you know have to be made. Um, it's it's. So, um, you know, if, if this works, great. If it doesn't, um, you know, I, you know, that's, you know, you know, that's becomes more of a, you know, public policy question. Jay, the facility is um, going to be taking kids from around the state or is there other localities that will be taking what normally might be a cohort in this facility? I, I, my assumption is this from around the state, um, we're not developing a different facility or cohort type facility. Uh, um, but Sean, I think maybe is the better person to answer this question. Um, sure. Do we see geographically speaking, though, this is about halfway to the northern border and the southern border. It's about equidistant, if my geography is somewhat correct. Yeah, well, I it's on. It's, it. it's yeah. on. It, well, it, it's mile 112, I think, on, on 93. So yeah. it's a little bit farther, farther north on the ha half side. Um, it is accessible to Barry because you know 302 is most folks in the room probably know. You know, crosses from uh, Newberry Bradford area over to uh, to Barry and and then can access 89 from there. Um, it's about. 40 minutes from that Hanover White River Junction area. Um, 
and probably about 30 minutes south of the St. John's Bear area. Um, but, you know, the Burlington area is probably roughly hour and 45 minutes, I would hypothesize without having timed it, um, but knowing how knowing that how far it is over to Barry and up, up the highway. So you, you have uh, St. Johnsbury Hospital 30 miles away, you got Dartmouth, the level one trauma center 40 minutes away or so? Yes. Okay. All right, well, we've got to move the conversation. Um, is there anything else about the building, the architecture that we need to talk about? I would just sure. point out that some of the, the cost for the renovation is making sure that we're uh, using building materials that that um, withstand the use of the, of the type of facility that we're using uh, for a secure facility and those tend to, to be more expensive. And so that is some of the cost of the renovation is just making sure we're using the, you know, the most appropriate uh, building products that are uh, you know, safe um, for the youth and safe for the facility as well. Okay. Warner's Gallery, Jake. That's what yeah, you got it. That's right. Yep. Yep. Uh, well <laughs> I want to turn to uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Jake. Could I ask one? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the adequacy of the facility. We, it's for six boys. Where does the number six come from? And what do we do if we have eight in need? Well, just as, as we do now, Senator, um, we, you know, our, our commitment is, and it was the commitment that um, was asked of us in the legislature when we closed Woodside and moved forward with this proposal is that we um, serve youth in the least restrictive environment. And so this facility will be a part of a larger continuum of care. And so we use a wide variety of providers now um, uh, based on the needs of the kids and where they're at. Um, there's many youth that have unique needs that we're not able to serve in state. And so those youth now are served out of state um, in, in, in specialized programs. And we also have many other uh, programs in the state that, that are, are short-term crisis programs, the more specialized programs that, that might um, address sexualized behaviors from youth um, or, or larger facilities like the, um, uh, the program for girls that's in Bennington, but also the program um, that SEAL runs in Depot as well. And so we have a wide variety of services of, uh, available to make sure all youth's needs are met. And over the last several years, um, you know, there was periods where we had no youth at Woodside. Um, and during the pandemic, just in the beginning when, um, you know, the system of care locked up just in response to the, the health crisis of the pandemic, well, you know, we, I think, got up to five youth, but um, then we've been able to close the facility. And, and, you know, for the youth that need that highest level of care right now, um, we've entered into a contract with Sununu. Um, and, we, you know, while it's certainly not been without its challenges, we've only needed to place one youth um, who really needed to be in the Sununu Center. Well, we've certainly asked our providers to step up and treat a higher level of youth in state than they normally would. And they would probably, and uh, um, you know, uh, you, you know, we don't see us exceeding the six bed capacity based on our experience and the decrease we're seeing of justice involved youth overall. I think this is the right size facility for Vermont. Um, we had a thirty bed facility um, at Woodside, and, and and it was one or two kids there. And for a facility that big to just have one or two kids didn't make sense. And it was really a jail like setting. It wasn't there therapeutic was actually counter therapeutic. And so we believe that, you know, this building will be therapeutic the way it's laid out. The programming will be therapeutic. The site is therapeutic. Um, and we feel like it, it will meet the needs of our, uh, of the boys that will be provided care there. Thank you. So just uh, to kick in off of Dick's question, out of state um, for youth that are not able to be handled in state, is Beckett currently involved in any of those out-of-state placements? Yes, and I'm just grabbing my list right now. Um, we have um, youth placed in, in their programs out-of-state right now, and, and Jay and Jeff can probably speak to that, but um, we utilize um, 
their program, which is an intensive residential program for adolescent boys. Um, we have a contract with them for their program, New Hampshire, of 25 beds. Right now, um, we have 19 youth placed in that program in New Hampshire. And so, you know, having this level of facility will allow us more flexibility of moving kids in and out of programs as their as their need, you know, to meet their needs. So our hope is, is that we won't, some of the kids that we send out of state, we might be able to serve in state now with this level of program that we're developing here in terms of the treatment. That's really one of our goals. Um, where is the Beckett facility in New Hampshire? I would defer to Jay and Jeff on the exact location of that. And, 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 and Jeff has technical difficulties I'm, I'm hearing about right now with his computer. So I'll, I'll field that question. Our New Hampshire programs are, are frankly several programs. Um, we have a fairly broad continuum in New Hampshire of programs from the Pike area, which is just, it's, it's across the river from Bradford um, on Route 25. And heading out Route 25 towards Plymouth, we have a few other programs. So those children that uh, Sean alluded to are, are really spread out, spread out amongst several different programs that we offer um, depending on the particular need. Um, we have a you know highly intensive program um, with, with, with what they call delayed egress doors in the Pike area. We also have a program in Pike that serves um, a really farm-like setting, a lot of uh, vocational integrated um, farm activities um, that um, kind of works with a lot of kids with a um, kind of autism type and uh, other issues um, like that, um, intellectual type issues that have manifested along with behavioral and mental health issues. And then over in Plymouth, we have a, a short-term assessment program, which is often used for about 90 days to really get a comprehensive assessment and, and transition the kid back to the, an appropriate setting, hopefully in Vermont pretty quickly. We have, I think, several, um, I think that's used quite heavily. Um, and we have a, an adventure program, which is um, tends to be more oppositional type kids who do well in kind of the wilderness programming type stuff. Um, so we actually have several programs in the corridor between Pike and Plymouth um, that serve the kids. Plymouth so. on uh, 25, that's what, about an hour away from Newbury? Yeah, it's, it's uh, about 25 miles down from Pike and Pike's about three or four miles in from the border. So, you know, and it's, you know, while it's a, co it's a fairly highly trafficked corridor by east-west standards of Vermont and New Hampshire, um, it's not a 60 mile an hour type highway. So it takes about an hour. Yeah. No, it's actually a, a beautiful ride on a motorcycle. Senator Mazza, yeah. you don't have to wear your helmet on it either. Just so yeah. you, you uh, know. Is this your district, Joe? Uh, it is. At least at the present time, because this is part of the six northeasternmost towns in Orange County. But I understand with our new uh, redistricting, it may be moved into Orange County. But what's, the, moment, reaction, what's the reaction of the community? Well, we're about to find out because that's what this first community forum is all about. Oh. Um, so far, I'm receiving emails with questions, but nobody actually chomping at the bit to say yes or no, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, I'd like to, um, I had Morning Fox on earlier, Morning I can't, if you, yeah, you're still here. Um, in a real quick overview, Morning, what do you think about this in relation to the mental health division? Uh, again, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Um, just having watched kind of the, the presentation uh, going through, uh, I think it's actually a fairly decent uh, design program. Uh, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, pieces that they have included in the design here are actually similar uh, to some of the concepts that we're working on in our uh, adult secure residential program that uh, we're still working on in the design aspects. Um, so, um, that coupled with the information that I have in regards to the, the programming, 
Um, it, it looks like a very solid program uh, just from, from this blush here. Okay. Um, committee, I'm going to leave it up to you. If you need to take a break, just um, take out your video screen. We'll expect you back whenever you can, but I'm going to try to keep going to get us through the afternoon. Let's keep going. Good. All right. Um, I have, I don't know whether Jay, you or Sean or Judith, you have anything else you want to add to the conversation at this point? Otherwise, I'm going to turn to BGS and let them weigh in. No, I think, no, that makes sense to us. Thank you. Okay. I have a whole lot of folks on the screen, as I understand it, from BGS. And uh, it includes Mark O'Grady, Jeremy Stevens, Joe Asia. Debrina Karish, and of course, Eric Philcorn, but we see him all the time. I won't worry about him. Yes, Eric, I know you're on the screen. I'm just a bench warmer. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure who would like to take the lead in the conversation, but if, um, I guess, Joe, I see your mute button has disappeared all of a sudden. How about we start off with you and give us some guidance as to who wants to say what in this conversation? Oh. Uh, Thank you, Senator. Uh, good afternoon, Joe Aja, design, uh, Director for Design and Construction for BGS. And it depends, if you wanna talk about the lease agreement, it would be Marco Grady. And if it's construction, it would, it would be Tabrina Karish. Well, we started on construction. So how about if we start with Tabrina and then we'll work our way into the conversation about the legal part of it. Okay, great. Tabrina, welcome to Senate Institutions. Hi, Tabrina Carriage, Project Manager with BGS. What can you tell us about the construction? Um, so I think that Jay gave a pretty good overview of, of the plan and the budget. Um, so I, I guess I just will answer questions if anyone has them. I um, have toured Woodside in the past and was struck by the very prison-like atmosphere. Um, your opinion on the presentation thus far about the difference in this building as opposed to Woodside? So Woodside is basically a correctional facility. It's a very old way of thinking about treatment of youth. Um, this facility is, is basically... Um, it's a more modern way of thinking. It's more of a mental health treatment rather than a correctional environment. Um, it's, it's, we're focusing on trauma-free design, focusing on rehabilitation and, and treatment rather than just a holding cell until they become adults. Assuming that the plan as proposed goes forward, do you know what the time frame would be for a uh, shovel in the ground to completion? Um, we're, we're looking at the permitting phase right now. That's really going to be the determining factor in when construction starts. Um, I believe, and Jay may be able to jump in on this a little bit. Um, I believe right now we're looking at occupancy towards the end of the year. Okay. Where's the three point, where's the three point million coming from? So, so, uh, oh, well, go <laughs> Norm, normally, you would see a, a, a project of this magnitude in the, in the capital budget, but yeah. given um, how the state is moving forward um, and working with a lease facility and the way we're designing this program, um, the restatement budget um, allocated $1.2 million in our operating budget this year to help pay for the renovations, understanding that once we got a, a, a better understanding of the design and the, and the construction costs that we would um, uh, come back in the Budget Adjustment ask, Act and ask for more dollars. And so there's an additional $2 million um, in the Budget Adjustment Act for the renovation. So combined, that would be the $3.2 million for the renovations. Um, I would add that um, after some testimony in the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, um, they um, asked uh, for some language in the budget adjustment to go along with that appropriation um, to make sure that BGS um, staff uh, signs off on the design um, before we moved forward with the renovations. And then also to make sure that the state protected its interest here, that we also secure a warranty bond. And we were in support of, of both 
um, pieces of that language that the house put in the budget adjustment along with that appropriation. So the landlord will put in how much towards this building? At this point, the landlord um, is providing the, the, the building that we are renovating. They are not putting in any cost because those would have just been billed back to us through the lease if, if we had moved in that direction. So the total cost of, of, of construction is 3.2 million, including that's design? Our, that's our current estimate based on our design work with the architectural firm in White River that's working with us. I had heard that the initial entryway was below ground. Is that going to fly? Uh, no, the, the entryway is above ground. Um, above the youth ground. programming is on the is on the below grade level, which is a walkout level. And a lot of the construction cost comes. There's an, a small addition on that walkout level and on the second floor, mm -hmm. or, which is the great floor, which would be the first floor in, in this case, um, mm -hmm. where there's a porch right now. So that would be the rooms for the youth and programming space above. Uh, most of your other costs come from taking this facility to the next level of, of um, ligature and tamper resistant construction. And there's also quite a bit of site work for the yard. Okay. I didn't, I couldn't tell from the diagram's size. Is there an elevator inside? There'll be a Lula lift. Okay. Where's that? Um, it's, it's basically an inexpensive elevator that you can go a maximum of two stories. Other questions, committee? Just one more. If we put the 3.2 million into the building, then what's our lease per month to the, to the landlord? Uh, I would de uh, defer to uh, uh, the deputy commissioner from BGS. Okay. He's the one working on that lease right now. To yeah, what, what would it cost us per month for the for the building, not talking about services, just the building. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Mazza. Mark O'Grady, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Buildings and General yeah. Services. That's an outstanding item. Um, the initial proposal was was uh, designed to cover the property owner's cost in, in recouping some depreciation and a return on investment. We have decided to engage the services of a commercial real estate appraiser, develop an as-is value of the property, as well as to assist in what fair market rent would be for the facility. Uh, it's going to be a challenge due to scarcity of available market data on a facility like this in this location. Um, so that is, we are currently negotiating the rate uh, for the actual lease payments. So before we move ahead, we'll know that figure. Correct, sir. Okay. Um, I see Catherine Benham was on my schedule. I don't know if she's here on the screen oh, okay. at the moment. Quick question. Sure, Cora, go ahead. Why aren't we looking to just buy a facility like this? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for me to, to put that kind of, I don't have it, you know, I have apartments. I don't see tenants who upgrade my apartments and then still pay me rent. You know, it, yeah, it, I just think it's a tough situation and, you know, it's gonna be more expensive than just owning something. Uh, uh, that's a, a great question, uh, Senator Parent. And I think I'll try to answer along with uh, Marco Grady from BGS. Um, I know when we were originally looking to replace Woodside, we, you know, it's a, it's a commercial type property. And so uh, we weren't able to locate an existing facility through the work, BGS's real estate work there. Uh, also, um, you know, the, to build a new facility based on the, the designs from, um, that came out like two years ago, there was an estimated cost. It was uh, 10 to $15 million, I believe. Um, you know, we are approaching this lease negotiations uh, with the understanding that, you know, as Mark said, we want to get a, a value of the property because we are entering into a long-term lease, one, to protect our interests, but also um, at the end of that, the state could choose to opt to purchase the building at that point. And, and Mark, I don't know if you want to jump in and add, add to that. Sure. Uh, it's an excellent point, Senator Parent. Um, as Commissioner Brown had indicated, uh, as part of the uh, engaging the commercial real estate appraisers are providing with an as is value. Um, and, you know, I completed a draft lease yesterday and sent it along to DCF to make sure that it captures um, everything that they need. And included with that was a purchase option to be exercised at some point. But I think once we look at the, uh, what the lease rate is, that is something that should be discussed. How long 
uh, how many years uh, of rent before we have paid for the as is value of the property. So very excellent point to be considered. And would we have the option like the right of first refusal on the property? I, the last thing I would see is, you know, if it's a cash flow, some investors can come in and buy, but I'd hate to see it get sold out from underneath the state if we put that kind of money into it. Senator, this is Jay Walter. Just, I mean, just to add a little perspective, you know, I, I think we'd be happy to sell it um, subject to price discussions. I mean, I, I think we've evolved this way because that seems like the way DCF has, in terms of not having to put, you know, they're trying to get the money for the renovations itself. Um, I think we've been pretty open to understanding the issue um, of the estate's investment. Um, counter, you know, counter to that is really the reality of um, we have a place right now that's a fairly nice facility that has um, alternative uses um, and could be sold in the marketplace right now once it's turned into a correctional type well, I shouldn't use that word. Sorry, um, but but you know, once it's turned into a secure facility, um, it doesn't have much value to us anymore either. Like like you know, so we have a loan out of the property, we have investment in the property, and you know, what we're really trying to protect is that, um, not to sort of, um, 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 you know, but we know once this facility is built. Uh, we need a plan that will allow us to lease it for a period of time to at least get our costs back, um, um, you know, with a, an appropriate, um, you know, rate of return for that, but not, you know, if the state wants to buy it, we're not going to, we're not going to stand in a way in a provision that allows you at any time during the lease, if you want to come buy it, to buy it. Um, but, but understand that one of the issues here is once we begin to turn this into a, a secure facility, it really has no value left to us. We're not gonna be able to sell it. There's not a lot of people trying to buy a six bed secure facility in Vermont. Mr. Chair, one more thing I, I just thought about. When we talked about this uh, doing away with Woodside, wasn't the proposal at that time, we didn't wanna own any more property. We wanted to have the youth uh, if you get one, you ship them to some facility that takes them for, for, for fee or two or three, because the uncertainty of having one or four or five or six, it would be cheaper just to take that individual and go to a private uh, a place to have uh, services done. So I'm surprised, and I guess we're in a, we're in a, this is a different decision, but we're back into owning a building again uh, or or having uh, responsibility for six beds versus if you have one or two, because I understand Woodside was down to one. Uh, and that's what the cost was, was phenomenal. And we could be in the same position again, one or two, yet sharing the cost of maxing the place at six. I, I'm just, but that's probably the policy dec decision that was made by this committee was made by somebody else. Maybe Mr. Chair, you know more about that than I do. Well, I, I probably know a little bit more, but suffice to say, we did have those conversations and um, I'm looking at this leased building as part and parcel of where we were heading in that conversation. So when Senator Parent brings up the question of, of making a purchase, um, I get a little nervous about purchasing when we still have that ultimate question. What is it we're trying to accomplish in the long term here? And I'm not... Uh, I guess I'm not 100% convinced that owning another piece of property is the smart way to go while we're in that continuing conversation of how many kids are we actually going to be looking at. Um, but I appreciate bringing that up. We're going to probably have some more conversation about it. Sean, you indicated, uh, maybe you or Jay said that the hope would be if everything went through that by the end of the year, we'd have uh, kids actually there. If we had to purchase from scratch a different building um, and then bring it up to snuff, am I safe in assuming it would take a great deal more time to have that happen? Yes, my understanding is if the state like purchased land and was going to build its own state facility, um, we would be looking at a five-year time frame probably from start to finish for that to occur. And, um, and given where we are here um, doing this similarly, depending on the building, 
Um, this building actually works well in terms of the footprint and what we're trying to do. So the renovations um, overall are not substantial. Um, it's more the cost of the other buildings could be more substantial renovations. And, um, and so the time frame would be longer. I don't have an estimate on that, but it certainly would be longer than uh, the time frame we're looking at here. Okay. Committee, any other questions for BGS? See, uh, Senator McCormick. Yeah, this is not so much a question, just a, a comment. Um, I've served in this committee previously, but it's, I've been gone for many years, so I almost feel like like one of the new kids. Uh, so I've been reluctant to to have to have too many opinions, but I, I find uh, Senator Maz's comments. Uh, I'm inclined to agree. I, I, I'm I'm leery of us putting money into property we're not going to own. It's just. Uh, I'm, I, I could be convinced, but I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical right now. Uh, Senator, I think you're, uh, you, you know, we understand your concerns. And I would say anytime uh, the state leases a facility for whatever purpose that, that, that we're leasing from a private landlord, um, there are costs that the state pays in, in terms of whether it's upfront or in upfit that then um, is baked into the lease that, that the state ultimately bears those costs. And I would defer to Mark to comment further on that. But I, but normally the state, when we're entering into a private lease, we ultimately bear the cost of whatever use of that facility upgrades are. Mark? So I'm gonna pause there to both Senator McCormick and Senator Mazza and suggest that somewhere in the past, the policy discussion got separated out from this committee. Um, it still remains that way in the House, and there is great wisdom in having both conversations in one committee, uh, because it, it becomes problematic when you're trying to distinguish the brick and mortar from the policy conversation. And I don't know how we ever entertain getting that back into this committee, but it is a subject of conversation that we ought to be having in the future. Um, in order to move this conversation along, I'm gonna to turn to the stakeholders, unless anybody from BGS or uh, Jay, you wanna finish off any thoughts? I should have asked earlier, Jay, the first time that we met with Senator Kitchell, um, you still had concerns about whether things were moving along the way you thought they were supposed to be. And uh, I'm just looking for a, really a yes or no answer. Are things moving along now more comfortably for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe in our first conversation, I was sort of trying to uh, identify that, you know, there's so many moving parts of a project like this. Um, part of, and part of that process being what we're doing right now um, at multiple committee levels. I, you know, frankly, I never expected to be spending in the last two weeks, four or five hours on a Zoom call uh, with the legislature in Vermont, you know, so there's a lot of public policy issues being sorted out still and, and, a, and a lot of efforts being put in by a lot of people to find the right resolution. So I, I don't want to convey that I felt any negativity towards it. Um, I was trying to convey, you know, we, we have a long ways to go um, but I do feel, you know, stakeholders are getting to the table, important dialogues happening. Um, so yes, I think we are moving along at an appropriate pace at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to the stakeholders and I'm gonna take them in priority as I understand them to be. Um, my normal highest ranking stakeholder on this list would be the guy that I have to call your honor in court. So Judge Grierson, if you happen to be listening and are available. Um, with, with an introduction like that, how could I not? Uh, hey, Judge Grierson, good afternoon. <laughs> I, I realize you don't often appear in front of this committee. No, uh, this this is the first time. I, I was glad to see oh, Dick and ask him all, <laughs> all those pointed questions. Um, you probably ought to at least briefly introduce yourself because we'll have new members of committee here. I will. Um, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, and I do believe Senator Benning. Thank you for inviting me. 
uh, thank the committee members for inviting me. I think it is the first time I've appeared before this committee. Um, and I think to move things along, I'm gonna send Dick a little oil for the hinges on his wallet and see if we can make <laughs> this project work. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have a lot to add to this, but, but let me tell you what my perspective is. And, and it's, it's quite simple. We need a facility of this kind, whether it's this plan or a different plan or a different location. We need this. And when I say we, I'm saying the judiciary uh, and, and all of the, the, the stakeholders in this process, the juvenile process, um, need a facility um, to, to address the issues that this population uh, brings. I don't have the information to say whether six is the right number or not. I know that the population at Woodside uh, went down drastically over the years and then once in a while it'll bump up. So I, I can't tell you that I, I have any uh, you know, specific knowledge on the number, but there's two things I'd like to have the committee think about it as they're talking with um, the folks from Beckett and, and Commissioner Brown, as well as uh, the, the folks that are going to have to pay for this um, uh, this site site improvements. Two things. One you already mentioned, or someone did, the need for um, making sure that there is a, a video uh, capability within this institution for a lot of the same reasons that the questions have been asked, and that is this is in a relatively remote location. Um, which means that if a, if a youth is required to appear in court, uh, they're going to have to be transported usually um, in, in, uh, in restraints uh, over long distances, uh, sometimes good weather, sometimes bad. Uh, sometimes when they appear in court, um, I've, I've certainly been in courthouses that the only way of getting the youth into the court room is through a public setting with restraints. Um, and then it can be for a very, very brief hearing, um, meaning that they're transported long distances uh, in restraints for what could be a less than a half hour proceeding and it's taken over an hour to get to that courthouse or, or longer. Um, if there has been, and I'm not suggesting there has been a silver lining in, in the uh, pandemic that we've all been experiencing for the last uh, year, it is the increased capability and the improvement in technology within the judicial system. And we continue uh, to expand that and explore new ways of conducting hearings remotely. And many of them are juvenile proceedings. I believe that when this pandemic passes, when the, when the, when the crisis is over, we will continue to see uh, uses for uh, video and audio uh, capability, remote hearings. Um, for the type of hearing I just described. Um, in addition, and I think it was mentioned in, in Senate Ju Judiciary uh, last week, uh, one of the committee members mentioned, um, because of the geographical distances uh, in Vermont and the difficulty in making those transports, the ability for a family caregiver to be able to communicate uh, even with video uh, is, is really important to maintain that contact. Um, and, and video will allow that. So that, I, this is whatever building there is, it has to be in uh, that building. Um, the, the other point I would make, and this, I, I hesitate to bring it up, but I'm going to because it's becoming more, I'm seeing more and more of this as an issue. And that is, this is a six bed facility as I understand it, and Commissioner Brown can correct me. But primarily for, um, I'll say, longer term stay, uh, more treatment than, than prison as one of the witnesses mentioned. The con one of the concerns I have is the lack of detention space in Vermont. And by detention space, as opposed to the kind of treatment that is in, um, th that this uh, facility envisions is th the youth who is um, out of control, picked up by police um, and, particularly now, as most of the committee members know and a lot of the folks involved in this hearing, we have now expanded the age of delinquency uh, to 18. And in another year, we're gonna to go to 19. So we're now bringing 18 and 19 year olds into essentially a juvenile system. 
Um, and sometimes there, we need a place for a short-term detention, even if it's overnight um, or very short term. Um, and we've, we've just had uh, situations um, recently where I think that need was, was demonstrated. So I know that's not in these plans and there may be very well be good reasons or maybe the commissioner and other folks have other ideas for this population. But if we're putting up a facility, um, I don't think we can overlook the need for a very short term uh, detention space either in this facility or somewhere in, in the state. So uh, that's all I have to offer really, Senator Benning. I'm, I've been listening to uh, the testimony and I understand that it's a substantial project and um, I, I um, I'm, I'm certainly available to answer any questions that anyone might have. Senator Mosley. Judge Gerson, uh, would, they, uh, would they house, what's the age would go at this facility? Are you saying up to 18 or 19 or is it still? It would be, if I'm correct, Commissioner, as we decrease the or increase the age of delinquency, uh, this population would be served by this facility. Yeah, so we when we um, started working with Beckett to develop um, this proposal, um, we entered into uh, uh, like a letter of intent and that letter of intent indicated that we could serve um, 18 year olds and, um, and 19 year olds in this facility in the future if, if that's the decision that, in the direction the state wants to go. Because I, I would agree um, with Judge Grierson that um, what we're seeing with the raise the age and kids coming into the DCF system um, that we need to account for, for the, you know, 18 and then in uh, July 1st to 22, 19 year olds. Um, and so, you know, we're approaching it, looking at that this facility could play a role, but also not to get too far down in the weeds. We did um, uh, put uh, funding in the Budget Adjustment Act and in the base 22 budget to build out resources for raise the age 18 year olds to develop some, some um, options to serve them either through like a transitional housing program with on-site support services for those youth who could come in um, that might come in in crisis and um, don't have another place that they could go safely stay. And so I agree, agree with Judge Grierson that, you know, th those are um, issues we need to pay attention to and we, and we are looking to address them in a couple different ways, but, you know, th th they are on our radar as well. Um, so to to just just great. If, someone, if someone goes to court and is 17 or 18, and they can sentence that person to this facility? Um, right now, um, you know, just as judges had authority for a, 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 a juvenile deemed to be delinquent and was taken into, you know, into placed into DCF custody, they could place that youth into Woodside, they will be able also to place that youth in this treatment center as well. This, this so, facility so will be available. So it's not the law that they must go there, it's up to the discretion of the judge? Y yes, in terms of sometimes the judge, also sometimes DCF, depending if a, a, a youth juvenile justice, you know, in the past. So, you know, you know we will be able to um, use short-term placements in this facility as well as the judge indicated the need for that. So if a youth comes in in the middle of the night, and the judge issues a detention order. I get that. Yeah, what if they get a sentence? Say they get a sentence. They serve there until they're 18 and then they go to the, the prison? Well, you know, we, we look at serving youth. It, uh, youth aren't sentenced that way um, in, right. in, the, in the juvenile system. Um, what they would do is place them in our care and the department's care and custody. And then we would um, serve that youth in the least restrictive setting based on where they are at that time. So they might start in a facility like this. Um, once they're adjudicated um, by the by the family court judge, um, and then we might then, um, in working with the court and their and their attorney and the state's attorney, step them down to other programs that are more appropriate in a least restrictive setting. So it really it's a really fact specific based on on the youth and where they're at in in terms of um, their their need for services. I didn't realize it was that. Uh, age was that that high? I thought we were talking about sixteen-year-olds and under. But... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's in part what complicates it, Senator Mazza, is because with the, uh, if you will, raising the age of, of delinquency, 
um, someone uh, who is 18, there are only certain offenses uh, that they may uh, be involved in at 18 that they can still go to the adult or criminal court. But what they can't do at 18, if, they, if it's not one of those offenses, uh, a lesser offense, but they're 18, uh, and for whatever reason, they may need to be lodged. They cannot go in. Um, I shouldn't say they can't go in a, an adult correctional facility, but it's extremely uh, complicated in terms of what they have to, uh, the procedures that have to be followed. So it, 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 it's a significant um, change in that respect. And, you know, this, the 18 year olds only began in July. So I think we are oh, learning okay. as we go along uh, that, that uh, some of the implications of, of this. Um, so I just think it's something, and I, I know the commissioner has that in mind. I mean, I'm not telling him anything he doesn't know. Um, it's a question of, you know, how do we address that issue? Um, but with that, that's, that's all I have. And thank Excellent. you. Um, before I turn to the next stakeholders, Joe Aja, Tabrina Karich, I'm trusting that you folks are considering the IT issues in the discussions about this building. I don't know which one of you would like to respond to that, but. I'd throw that to Tabrina. Okay, Tabrina, if you're still with us. I am here. Okay, the uh, judge raised the concern about having IT available for video conferencing and whatnot with the court system. Mm -hmm. Is that conversation taking place now within your bailiwick? We have not sp spoken about that in the design meetings that I have participated in. However, the court system works with our correctional facilities um, and our mental health facilities to create a video program. And so I see no reason why we cannot do it in this facility as well. Okay, I just want to make sure that that issue is not left off the plate in your conversations mm -hmm. about how the state contracts with Beckett. Um, it is, as far as I can tell from my position, and I'm a trial attorney, so I understand that COVID brought on our video conferencing, but after COVID is done, I definitely see the wisdom in using IT to prevent kids from having to be taken with handcuffs from point A to point Z for a final, or I mean, a, a very finite hearing. Um, so I'm hoping that this issue is part of the conversations going on in building construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were moving in that direction before COVID. Okay, um, thank you. And, and gonna... Senator, you have our commitment that that will be a part of this facility when it goes operational. I know we've already looking into that we're gonna have to upgrade the internet connection coming into the, the property and the facility to make sure that we have the bandwidth to support those uses. So those co initial conversations have started to make sure we have all the pieces in place for that to happen. Great. Um, I have three folks left officially. I have Marshall Paul, AJ Rubin, and John Campbell. Um, AJ, I guess I'm gonna start with you if you're still here. Yep, see you down in the corner. Um, you have sent us testimony um, I can probably predict that most of us have not had a chance to get to it yet. And keeping in mind that the discussion is really centering on the brick and mortar of the building, um, you're coming to us from Disability Rights Vermont. I'm anxious to hear what your thoughts are and what you've heard in the actual design of the building, especially, and any other comments you want to uh, give us as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity and the invitation. Um, I did provide the committee with a, a, a blurb about what DRVT does. So any of the senators who aren't familiar with us, you can look that over and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we've been very grateful for um, Commissioner Brown and the team at DCF and the Beckett team um, in their willingness to collaborate with us uh, on the program design and the physical plant. Uh, my staff has been to the facility. We've seen it uh, in person. Um, and so I, you know, I want to uh, give kudos to the state and Beckett for being open and, and, um, and working with us. Um, I did send a short two page letter to the committee that outlined seven or eight different specific concerns we have with the brick and mortar issues. 
Many of those issues were discussed today, um, and I can certainly respond to those, but the, the big ones were, were, were mentioned. Um, the, you know, the biggest concern we have, which is a brick and mortar issue, is um, the extent to which this is really a facility that we need, uh, another locked facility in Vermont. Um, I did provide the committee with our report named Wrongly Confined, which is a sort of a systemic uh, analysis of our AHS human services and the extent to which we're not funding community supports, um, but putting too much money in these locked facilities. Um, uh, I, and so a concern we have is that if you build it, they will come. Um, if there's no acknowledgement about the negative impact of putting youth in locked facilities that are hard locked, uh, once you're inside the facility, it's gonna look a lot like a, like a correctional facility because it's gonna have hard locks. Um, and um, it's not clear to me that there's clarity amongst the administration about what this program is for. Um, it looks like kind of, it could be both for a place to put kids who are arrested and have to be detained quickly and a place to keep kids for four, three or four months in a locked facility. Um, you know, if, the, if it's only about the former, then having a facility way out in the woods is not a great idea. You wanna have small facilities around the state if it's the latter about a treatment center, what, what kind of treatment is it? I heard the commissioner say that they might be bringing folks from out of state into this program, uh, but I haven't heard that yet. So, um, so we're really, you know, we wanna emphasize that putting a child in a locked secure facility like this has negative impacts on the kid and that's not being acknowledged. And there has to be some sort of policy development to not overuse this facility. Um, but if it is going to happen, um, our comments about the physical plant, um, you know, uh, have been considered uh, by Beckett and DCF, and we're happy to keep working with them. Things like the, the gymnasium, access to video conferencing, not using the calming room as an isolation room, um, and issues about, you know, sunlight in the, in the common rooms. And also sort of the, 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 the fact that the upstairs rooms where staff are going to be are big, comfortable rooms, and the rooms where the children are going to be living are cell-like. You know, in the design. So those are another reason why we should limit who gets put into this um, building. Um, um, and so again, I think I don't want to stray on the policy stuff. Um, we are grateful for the input and, um, and we have expressed our concerns about the actual uh, nuts and bolts of it. I don't know if you heard Jay Walter's testimony about him being a reformed attorney. Have you ever heard that term before? You know, I work for Ed Paquin, who keeps saying he's a reform legislator, but he sure does like spending time in the legislature. So I assume Jay watches courtroom dramas or something. Um, but, you know, the legal issues are, are very serious. And, you know, it can't be understated that when you build a locked facility for children, you are inviting a lot of scrutiny about how it's used. Okay. Thanks for coming and being patient. Um, I am left with um, Marshall Paul and John Campbell. That means I've got the state's attorneys on one side and the defense attorneys on the other. Who should I choose? Marshall, oh, yes. welcome. <laughs> um, so thank you. I can go fairly quickly here. Um, my way of introduction, I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the deputy defender general and the chief juvenile defender for the state. Um, and I want to say just up front that we're very supportive of the direction that this project has gone. Uh, we're supportive of the direction it's gone on a policy level. We're also uh, supportive of the direction that it's gone in a in the sort of bricks and mortar operational level, which is not to say that we don't uh, just like Disability Rights Vermont have concerns. Our concerns are, you know, essentially the same issues that Disability Rights Vermont talks about. We are concerned about how the program will be used. We're concerned about some of the, you know, there's things that we, we'd love to see a larger gymnasium. I understand that's not likely in the cards, uh, just given the facility itself. Um, but the, you know, we don't see those concerns as being problems that would interfere with our support for this project overall. Uh, really, those are just uh, issues that we are watching to see how they develop as this project moves along. Um, I do think that it's very, you know, this project is important. The timing of this project is important. We, you know, it's really important that we get this, uh, that we get this program up to speed 
and on its feet so that it can be occupied as quickly as possible because we are, you know, sitting here, we've, we've started the process of raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction in Vermont. Um, we've done an incredible job in Vermont of limiting the number of kids who are getting pulled into these higher level placements. And I wanna, you know, I wanna make clear that that was really the first step to make this type of a project possible. If we were trying to do this type of a project, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago, we would be sitting, you know, it would be, it would be really an impossibility just given the number of kids who at that time were occupying the highest levels, you know, of our system of care, who were demonstrating, you know, really high need and really high risk and really were being put into programs that were designed to meet that high need and high risk, which meant that Woodside was, uh, you know, very full and sometimes over full. It meant that programs out of state that serve those high need, high risk youth were very full. And really what happened is not, you know, it was a, there, we had had a system of care in Vermont for a long time that had good resources available at the very low end, at, you know, for kids who needed nothing but, for example, a foster home to be in. Um, and we had really good, or we had a really, I wouldn't say good, but um, we had a lot of beds available in that higher end of care. You know, the kids who were going to Woodside, who were going to out of state, uh, you know, secure programs. But what we were lacking was that middle tier, the place where kids go to when they step down from Woodside. I can't count. You know, I used to be the attorney that represented every kid at Woodside in what we call their administrative detention hearings, the hearings about whether or not uh, kids should stay at Woodside when they had been placed at Woodside. And the number of kids that we were talking about who everybody in the room, DCF, the defense, the institution, everybody agreed that they were ready to leave Woodside, but there was just nowhere for them to go. And that was really, that was a problem. That's, that's why Woodside was such a, you know, highly populated program, even when we didn't really have the need for it. We didn't, you know, it was kids that everybody agreed didn't need to be served by that level of care, didn't need to be served in a secure facility, but there was nowhere for them to go. And so what happened in the years that led up to this decision to close Woodside and develop a new placement was really a you know, fundamental reimagining of that entire middle tier of our system of care so that we could be taking these kids once they had stabilized, once they were out of a situation of crisis, and once they could be given treatment in a less secure environment and having those places available for them so that they could be moved out. And that's what's made it so that we can even be here having this conversation about, you know, what is ultimately going to be a six bed facility, which is, you know, if you look at the last couple of years of Woodside's population, that's probably, that's, that's right on as far as what the population ought to be. Six is sort of on the high side for essentially the last year of Woodside's population. Um, so I wanted to start just by acknowledging that because I think it's really important because that really is, you know, that's the best way to address this problem. And that's what that's the work that's been done that I don't think has necessarily gotten the appreciation that it deserves uh, because it really has a lot to do, not just with getting kids out of a program that was deteriorating and really bad uh, counter therapeutic for those kids, um, but also just making sure that kids generally are getting the treatment that they need in the least restrictive place that they can get it. Um, so the only thing that I want to just chime in on as far as the bricks and mortar go and just echo something that's already been said is the importance of having video conferencing capability. It's nothing crazy sophisticated, um, really just having a decent computer with a camera and Zoom and WebEx on it is all that's needed. But the one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I think is really important is making sure that that equipment is in an area where kids can be unsupervised so that kids can have confidential uh, attorney-client conversations without having to have a staff member in the room. That's been a problem for us, for example, in having certain conversations and having 
certain video, uh, it was a problem. It's been more or less rectified at this point. But when we first moved uh, adult prisoners to Mississippi, um, there was places where they could go to be in front of a video camera so that they could participate in a hearing, but no place where they could be in front of a video camera to have a private conversation with an attorney. So I think that's just the one thing that I would add to that conversation is that it's important not only to have the video uh, capabilities, but also to have that in a place where it's going to be okay for kids to be uh, unsupervised, um, or at least if they're going to be supervised, that it's, you know, visual supervision from outside the room so that their conversation with their attorney can remain confidential and privileged. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, committee. Many questions. We don't see any, Marshall. Thanks for coming. Thank John you. Campbell. Are you still out there, John? Yes, I'm still here, Senator. I, I guess I realizing that, you know, importance, you know, being the last person, you know, I get relegated to this. Hello, buddy. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Senator. How are you? Terrific. It's been a while since I've been in institutions also. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to see you have my good friend, Senator McCormick and Senator Parent there with you. Um, Senator Ingalls, we have not met yet. One of these days we'll, we'll meet. I, I used to uh, be a member of that, uh, of your wonderful group uh, known as the Senate. And uh, in fact, it's interesting because while I was listening to everybody testify here earlier, I, I was thinking that, you know, there's not been often, or there often has not been times that I've you know, really kind of wanted to be back in, the, in uh, the chair there that you guys are in. But this is one conversation I think I would love to have been a part of the institutions committee. Um, however, I won't talk about um, some of the policy issues. I'll, I will just talk to you about uh, a couple of issues that, that uh, I think are extremely important. I think Judge, first of all, Judge Gerson really summed it up the best with all of it. So I'm not gonna repeat what he has to say. The importance of getting something um, up and running, it, it cannot be understated. Uh, we're having some significant problems um, around the state, and actually they're, they're going to be uh, discussed on Friday in, in Senate Judiciary. But um, I, I, I am one of the belief that we need, we should have a facility now. I mean, when uh, the former commissioner decided to shut down um, Woodside, uh, and again, not arguing one way or the other, whether it was a good thing or not, I, it left a significant void um, in, in, um, uh, having to deal with with uh, the people that this uh, place served. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I know that they've said that this should be up. I, I guess I heard that said that it, they thought it should be up and running by the end of the year. And um, I'm still waiting for a dormer to be put in this place, uh, which uh, was supposed to have been started last year. So, right. um, yeah. okay. with that... <laughs> Where are you in a cellar or what? Yeah, no. Patty put me up on the third floor. She, you know, it's um, I, I, I'm stuck up here. If I if I stand up, I I'll hit my head. But uh, <laughs> she's busy talking and you know doing the real business downstairs, making money. So, um, uh, but anyway, all all kidding aside, uh, I, I'm just hoping that's the case. But um, I I think that we are in very dangerous territory. Uh, in the interim uh, period, uh, especially when you look at some of the problems we've been having with with uh, finding you know, locations at the right time for some of the youth that are served, uh, you know, a lot of these time, a lot of times, uh, the the youth are not getting in trouble necessarily uh, during the morning hours, and it's usually late at night. And you know, we've had several uh, incidents, uh, especially up in St. Albans area in Franklin County, where you know, the youth have been um, arrested. Or I shouldn't say arrested, but taken into custody, and uh, you know, 11 and 12 o'clock at night, and the only place they they could have gone would have been 204 down in Bennington, and of course, there's no transportation; no one uh, is there to transport them. So, um, in several cases, they've had to stay in hotels. Um, there's been a couple of incidents that we just had, especially with an 18-year-old, and this was up in the Northeast Kingdom, where there was no place to uh, take that person, and so. Uh, the, the, uh, they ended up getting, you know, basically kicking the guy out, uh, citing him to come back the next day. And here it was, uh, 18 year old, no place, no home. And he was, uh, it was like 30 degrees, uh, and he's out there, uh, no place to go, but sleeping on the ground. I think he slept behind a dumpster. 
And, you know, so there's so many things here that are just so wrong with this. Uh, you know, we're a better state than that, number one, uh, when it comes down to, it's not just the safety of the community, it's also the safety of the person that we're talking about, the youth. Um, so I know that might come, you know, sound strange coming from the state's attorney, the prosecutor, but it's true. I mean, really, we, we have an obligation here. We're, we're not a, uh, you know, a, a, a one of these states that, uh, uh, or a country that, that, um, uh, feels like uh, if you've committed uh, a crime or if you've, you've done something wrong that you're automatically uh, just cast aside. Uh, we just don't do that. And so I think the, uh, the sooner we do this and get this accomplished, the better. One thing that I do want to point out about this, um, you know, being over in Bradford, that does concern me a bit is what I initially said about the transportation. Um, you know, Bradford's like, what, about two and a half hours away from Bennington and probably the same from St. Albans. And uh, if if they're if it's in the you know at nighttime, the state paid deputies from the sheriff's departments, they've already put their eight hours in, and they're not obligated to come in to um, you know to do a transport. And we found and uh, that you know when they're called at you know twelve o'clock at night, they're saying you know what I'm sorry I'm not driving down to Bennington because they'll end up being stuck down there waiting. Um, it's not just the drive itself, but, you know, you just drive down and back, but also the, the, the time of getting them settled in. So um, there, there's a serious problem there. And when you, when you put those, that extra uh, mileage on, and it's not a central location, uh, that's just uh, creating more, more problem, more issues, I think, than, than uh, I would like to see. Um, and finally, I think the uh, issue of the having the video there, I, and I think we're, we can probably all agree that that's essential. It, there's no sense in doing anything and building anything in today's uh, society, especially the post-COVID, uh, without some type of um, ability to do virtual reality and vir virtual um, communications, such as what we're, what we're uh, doing right now. So um, I would encourage, and I think BGS, uh, Mark O'Grady, uh, he's he's great in any project that I've been involved with with Mark. He's he's uh, and, their, and their team over there. It's always been top notch. Um, and the uh, commissioner Fitch, she's done a great job. So um, I think that that will you'll be served well by that. Uh, and then the other matter is probably um, uh, as far as policy issues. I I think I'll reserve any comment, but I may contact you guys individually. I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll see. Especially Senator Mazza, because I needed I needed some apple pies. <laughs> were you, John, were you in the Senate when the decision was made to split policy off from institutions? You know, I I, I actually, you know, it's funny because I have it on my notes. The first thing was that when you mentioned that. Now that I've a chance to to look down there, I, I agree. I. I thought we you still maintain the policy on 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 um, you know certain issues. I. Dick, you know, you brought, you know, Senator Moss is. Oh, no, uh, no, it was, uh, it was a decision between judiciary and judiciary, I think, felt strong about taking it. And yeah. I think that's how it happened. Hmm. There wasn't it, a big fight over it. I, I think on this one issue is, I, I don't care, like, uh, you know, I think right. maybe you should have joint meetings, but, but um, if the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing on this one, uh, there's, I think you're looking for some serious, you know, problems. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I'm somewhat envious of Alice Emmons having both issues in her jurisdiction. And uh, while I serve on judiciary, and that's helpful, the uh, rest of this committee is not really on the money as far as the policy questions that are producing all this conversation. When well, you, you talk about uh, lack of um, uh, this, this being out in the middle of nowhere, technically, this location in my eyes, is a heck of a lot better than Essex Junction because virtually the entire southern half of the state is so far away from Essex Junction um, that all of those transportation issues are certainly at the forefront. But, you know, that's a two-hour, two, two-and-a-half-hour trip from Brattleboro or Bennington. So it, virtually the bottom half of the state is distanced. Um, there is a lot of what you're saying that's true if we had two separate facilities and could divide them or even three separate facilities. But now we're talking a whole bigger, much bigger investment. And I don't think we're in a position to, to even think about that at the moment. 
I, I agree there. Uh, you know, one thing about the committees, and this is why I think it's important um, uh, from a knowledge standpoint uh, with policy and also with the bricks and mortar, though, is one of the questions that I think Senator Mazza had with the 19 year olds. I mean, some, most people would think, okay, we're not going to have 18 or 19 year olds in, in this facility, but that's, that. yeah, but that's exactly what you're going to have. And, um, and, you know, of course, Senator Benny, you're, you're on judiciary and you're also, you know, um, uh, practicing uh, attorney uh, in, in the criminal um, system. So I, you'll know, but it, it could easily slip by and some things could slip through the cracks and you guys could be planning on making a, a, a decision about uh, a facility without realizing, you know, well, what's the facility going to be used for and, and who are the people that will be served uh, at, in that facility. Right. So um, I think, you know, maybe, a, a, you know, some joint meetings would certainly be in order if, if I was back there. Yep. Um, but I'm not a pro tem anymore, so. Well, just point of information, I'm not practicing anymore. I actually know how to do it. Yeah. Um, Senator McCormick. Yeah, just on, on the, the distinction between uh, funding and policy, I'm actually disappointed that my uh, law school trained colleagues aren't able to somehow make that simply go away based on how you phrase it. I think this committee should decide what we want to spend money on. And that might ov might overlap into policy. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Well, yeah, I think you need to take that up with, with uh, the powers that be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he scares me, so I, I can't. I, I think that's, you know, um, a lot of people feel that way. So that's why <laughs> That's why it is the way it is probably in the Senate and not in the House. Yeah. But right. I, I mean, I must say, though, just in his defense, he's he's put a lot into this. You know, the whole oh, yeah, yeah. raising the age. Well, you you all did on that committee. Um, and he is probably the most knowledgeable person uh, of juvenile justice, I think, in the in the uh, uh, in the legislature. Um, you know, when it comes down to things, especially like this, because of his experience with 204 and his experience even before then. Yeah, like I, always, John, you did a good job. That was very interesting today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and that was good. Good. I guess that's why I said, just shut up, John. It's time to go. No, no, no. I, I'm just, I'm just thanking you for some good, good thoughts that you put into this. I, I appreciate well, that. You know, it's good. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate it. Our senators, uh, I appreciate it. And um, if there are any, not any other questions, I will sign off. Thanks for being patient and sticking around. No problem. Thank you, guys. All right, committee, I am out of witnesses. and um, We're out of energy. Yeah, we're all out of energy. I don't know if anybody, Russ, you got a question or a comment? You got to unmute yourself. Um, I hear the passion of everybody speaking, and I think that's great. And, um, and nobody wants to hear this question, but I think it needs to be asked. What, what does it cost to house um, one of these kids if, uh, if we didn't build this facility and we had a place to put them? I mean, what, 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 what's the cost of doing that, of housing one child um, in another facility? I mean, they, they must be available uh, to the level of what we're being asked to consider here, uh, we, and we must know that number. It's a valid question. I don't know, Sean, if you have that off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, if you get, give me two seconds, I can, I can tell you. Um, um, so we, um, in the interim, entered into an agreement with the state of New Hampshire to place youth that need the highest level uh, of, of a secure setting that would have been Woodside or this facility um, with their Sununu Youth Center in New Hampshire. Um, and so we negotiated uh, a contract to place youth there. We've had to utilize it once um, um, in late summer into early fall for one youth. That cost us um, around $1,550 a day. So if you annualize that cost, and then we're also using other in-state settings too right now for youth, which are very expensive as well, but just to place one youth for a year in the Sununu Center would be um, almost $570,000 a year. Thank you. So, Corey, just for your info, you, evidently you get a, a facility like this named after you if you run for governor. 
So in your case, if you were governor, this would be the Parent Youth Center. I would prefer to have my name on other things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit your name after you, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Committee, I want to thank you very much. It's been a long day. Um, we will be back again tomorrow at 1.30. Everybody else who's on the screen, appreciate you all coming and hanging out with us this afternoon. And we will see you again. Denise, if you could uh, take us off of YouTube and stick on the line with me for